session, I'm going to keep it to Susan Park, who is an assistant professor at the University <coughs> of um, Minnesota. And he did his PhD work at Carnegie Mellon University and then a postdoc at University of Pennsylvania. Um, the reason for inviting you <laughs> is that um, despite the fact that CVPR this year has something like 3,000 computer vision people in it, and seriously, by next year, it'll be probably 5,000 and it keeps growing. Um, egocentric computer vision, in other words, computer vision applied to sort of real life data sets as opposed to things like ImageNet. Um, that I think um, that's what you were showing before. Um, it's still a really small field. And in fact, probably if something were to if there were a gas leak in this room, we would probably destroy about half the people who are actually interested in one of those three types of people. Be careful, everybody. Uh, anyway, uh, listen, thanks so much for coming. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I'm Ken Supart. I'm from uh, Minnesota, and I'm a uh, assistant professor there. And I've been working on first-person vision from a computer vision perspective. And here I'd like to share my thought and the grand vision toward applying the first-person vision to robotics. So, the, as uh, AI and robotics uh, advance, now it's possible to design a robot that can play ping pong. This is a robot uh, designed by Jan Peters group from Germany, where it shows amazing visual sensing and model skills. And especially the ping pong is a very difficult skill to learn because we have to understand that the ball and racket dynamics. So this. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the system is a composed of like a, the cam, multiple camera instrument in Germany that can track the ball in three-dimensional space very precisely. And they train the robot such that it can generate the, the trajectory of the joint angle that produce uh, the possible swing. Okay? Of course, this system can play against the human like this, and sometimes it fits the human too. So, how this system is designed? So this is how they collect data. Okay? Human move along with the, the robot and demonstrate the, the joint angle trajectories. Okay? So the question here is whether this learning paradigm is uh, scalable. Okay? So can we teach very sophisticated and skillful the, the technique in ping pong to robot like this way? Or can we uh, teach like hundreds of thousands of robots that has a different stylistic uh, swings. Can we do this? Maybe it is a, quite challenging by teaching like this way. So my idea is maybe we can use the head-mounted cameras. We ask people to wear the head-mounted camera and demonstrate their skill and maybe we can learn from their demonstration. So this is my idea. Okay, so for example, this is a, a video of uh, a first person video of uh, ping pong playing from the experienced players. Uh, it, sees that, it sees that it's quite shaky and very uh, fast and blurry. It's very difficult to see this and it's nauseous, right? But this video encodes the most important <coughs> signals of playing, <coughs> which is eye hand coordination. Okay? The camera follows the what the players see, which indicates the what to look when you're playing ping pong. Okay? Also, it can and somehow partially observe the hand uh, movement as well. So, my grand vision is answering this question: Can we train robot by learning from first-person demonstration? Probably, I don't think I can answer this question throughout this talk, but. I will share my uh, initial effort to uh, make this happen. So what can we learn from first-person demonstration? First of all, we can learn their behavior directly. We can clone the human behavior so that we can transfer to robots. So how can we learn, how can we clone the human behavior from first-person demonstration? Okay. Consider man in the orange box. Can we predict where he moves? from this image. And this 
this type of problem has been widely studied in robotics and computer vision that model the human behavior from third-person cameras, such as the surveillance cameras, okay, like this kind of setting. My question is, can we, can this system model the way we perceive and the way we per, uh, behave? My argument is not, because we can actually understand what this guy is thinking. So my, I argue that if you want to understand, model this guy's behavior, we should put ourselves into their shoes. We should visually experience what he's like. For instance, this is the image that he received from his perspective, first person. Okay. And uh, with that, because you have two eyes. All those visual semantics, scenes are deployed to afford my some straightforward action, for action. Okay. And the images is represented such that uh, we have a strong emphasis on the nearby area and all the reasoning about occlusion, and the visual semantics is relation to the, the camera web. So, uh, none of this reasoning can be done from third person camera such as surveillance camera. So we have to use this egocentric camera to understand, to model the behavior of the people. So in this world, we use uh, uh, the egocentric image to predict where I'm supposed to move in this image domain. So this is like the, 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 the ground plane that we projected onto the, uh, the image, and we predict where I'm supposed to be after 5, 10, and 15 seconds later. This heat map represents the, the likely location over time. Okay? And this is overall trajectory. This is like the location of the agent or the item? A, uh, the agent, the actual movement, action. So this is over a trajectory, that some trajectory actually go behind the display. Right, so why this is a challenge? Why this problem is a challenge? So I will give you a very contrived example. So let's say I have a first person image here, which is in, uh, in, in, in my training data. Okay? So I, and I have uh, my future trajectory as well on, on this training data. So I would like to predict the, my behavior in this new image. Okay. So since these two images has a very similar visual semantics and the geometric configuration, there's a wall, there's a uh, the sidewalk, there's a cars and tree and so on. They are spatially related and very similar to each other. So we can actually clone this behavior. Okay. But as you see, this cloning doesn't make sense because they are not uh, geometrically consistent. Okay? Even though we correct the, uh, the uh, geometric consistency, we still violate the, the visual semantics. Okay? Now this is not visually, uh, the semantic is not correct as well. So we need to have some representation that can model this geometric and visual semantic together. So uh, here, consider a man with the first person image eye. Okay? And he navigate into the scene by planning his trajectory onto the ground plane. Okay? And we represent the tra trajectory on this uh, <laughs> trajectory using the, as a function of a first person image eye. Okay? So we represent the a sequence of motion, sequence of motion as a function of my first person image. This indicates that I can actually relate my visual semantic with my action. So uh, I'm going to model as a, a function of in a first person image, right? And in order to encode the visual, uh, the, the geometric and this visual semantics, we project the first person image onto the ground plane. So this is like projection of this first person image onto the ground plane. And this projection allow us to represent the, the geometrically consistent and semantically consistent uh, representation where even though uh, there is uh, the head motion, uh, which is like uh, always uh, presented in, in the first person image, the 
this, this representation is still consistent. So using this representation, uh, we can run this function, the G function. So in order to do so, I collect a lot of data with my students. So I ask one student where uh, these two GoPro cameras here, and he, I ask him to uh, walk around the, the, this uh, downtown Philadelphia and, and areas of the schools. So we can collect the, uh, the RGBD data from this of uh, two stereo cameras. So I have a first person image here. And then since uh, in training data, since I already have been there, I can actually associate my future trajectory with my image. Okay? So in my training data, I can label my image based on my future trajectory. So this is my future trajectory and this is my first person image. And I have a collection of this pair in my training data. And Note that there's no manual annotation is required for this test because like the trajectory construction can be done by structure from motion, which is, is a, uh, a well-established uh, algorithm in computer vision. Sorry, black that. Uh, so uh, this is like some visual feature we extract from the image. So uh, sorry, I didn't mention this. So again, I can uh, collect a lot of data by walking around the scene without any manual annotations. And the scene, uh, we collect the data across the different scenes, for instance, like Ikea, uh, Costco, malls, and, and all the streets in the Philadelphia. And that comprises of like 13 indoors and 13 outdoors, and which is like about the nine hours of walking data. So using this data, we can learn the function uh, and we can predict, using this function, we can actually predict the, my future trajectories, given a first person image. Okay. And here I'm going to show you uh, some more qualitative uh, example where on the left, I'm showing the ground truth, uh, the first person image with my ground truth trajectory. Okay. On the right, I'm showing the predicted trajectory. So here we don't have any tracking. We detect each, uh, we predict the trajectory at every time instance. So this trajectory reflects the walking preference because we learn directly from the, the thing. Is that walking. separate for each of your different scenarios or is it combined across them? You mean the training and testing? Yeah, so when you predict Yep. Are you predicting based on all the different scenarios, Costco and all the others, or separate locations? We have a separate data. Uh, we have a separate location, separate time, and so on. So separate so the model. The model, yeah, model. model is the same. Yeah, model is the same. Yeah. Model is the same. We train from the. It's trained separately. Yeah, 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 yeah. You have a separate Costco model. No, 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 no. We have a we have a global model. We have a, sorry, sorry about that. Yeah, I miss it. No, no, no. Those are all the systems. We have actually two models. One model for the indoor, one model for outdoor. So the interesting thing here is that the, this area is occluded by car. Okay? If something is occluded, we cannot make any prediction behind this. But by learning the visual semantics with that, we can actually predict the sub trajectory that goes behind the car. There could be the, some space where we can actually walk through. So here's another data uh, that we can uh, predict the trajectory in the dynamic scenes where there's a lot of people uh, walking by and, and there's a car and so on in the cars. And this trajectory actually uh, the, avoid the obstacle and also reflect the, the, the walking preference. And this is an indoor shopping mall. And this is uh, the IKEA scene where uh, the, we, we generate the trajectory that can circumvent a lot of different uh, furniture. Although this same scene is not presented in the test. Okay. 
Right. So I've, the, I've talked about the future localization. Given image, we predict the trajectory, future trajectory. So the, the lesson that we have learned from this practice was there's a strong correlation between the, my visual semantic and my action. So my, uh, this visual semantic afford us to actually make an action, take the actions in this state. So here, for example, the scene, uh, there is like a fence, there's a building and sidewalk and cars and so on. There's a lot of uh, visual semantics that deploy in front of me. And that allow us, allow me to actually walk through this uh, forward action. But the question is, can we mentally visualize, can we change the, my future actions? For instance, can I make a right turn from this image? How should I actually modify my image to make a right turn? So in order to make a right turn, I have to create, virtually create maybe some intersection or happen. For instance, like this. Okay. So, uh, if I have to, uh, if I can make it brighter, I have to create some information. <coughs> so the question is, uh, how can we embed this visual semantics into the original image so that we can, this, the original image can afford new actions. So here's uh, uh, our very early result where uh, we uh, synthesize a new image, okay, based on the new trajectory. So the nearby area is almost a copy from the, the, my original image, but the wrong term area, the wrong range area is actually synthesized to make the right term action. That affords new actions. So by doing so, we can change my future action uh, based on uh, this uh, synthesized language. Any question? I guess I'm, I'm wondering, so, uh, I mean, just understand it. So, so there's, there's two things you could imagine. Like one is, like you're saying, we just predict some new action, which is consistent or somehow with the 3D geometry of the scene. Mm -hmm. so predict that you're going to be able to do something that would avoid obstacles and then only be in the free space. And then it looks like you're also just showing some kind of image synthesis. Yep. So I'm not sure I understand why the two are connected. Like why do you, why couldn't you do one without the other? So, uh, I have to admit that, I mean, this work uh, is a different from, from this one. This I is a new it. work kind of that we are, thing. yeah, different thing. But the, here I like to prove, uh, show the, like, uh, the, the, the strong correlation between the visual semantics mm -hmm. and the, my, uh, the action that I can take on this question. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is another uh, new example where uh, here this is the original image. I can uh, I can synthesize new image by actually removing the, uh, the the building on the right, and then create a small shortcut to make the right turn. For this image, uh, this is uh, uh, I, I guess is a cost setting where uh, the straightforward action is actually modified to make a right turn action where we. Visual, uh, virtually generate the, 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 some aisle so that we can walk through. So we project that this kind of technique can be useful to the, the path planning for the robotics so that this, uh, the visual, uh, mental visualization allow us to give uh, the, uh, the feedback signal to the robot that can verify whether this path is plausible or not. So I talk about the behavior clone. So we can directly clone the behavior from the first person demonstration. But this behavior cloning does not tell anything about the intent behind the behavior. Okay? So uh, in robotics, this intent can be translated to learning dynamics and control. So uh, he, uh, here, I'm going to talk about a little bit about how to learn this dynamics and control, this first-person demonstration. Okay. So this is uh, uh, the YouTube video of people where they have mounted camera and mounted mic. Okay. And this video not only tells us about the way where he traveled, but also how he controlled his bike 
to balance his posture and move forward. And also, he can also tell us about the all physical force that applied to him. So, in this work, we use we exploit the inverse control scheme to extract the force that applied to the mountain bike from just YouTube video without any extra sensors. We just use a first person video to extract all the forces that apply to the mountain biker and control signals. For instance, we extract the gravity signal from the video mesh, okay? and we extract the roll torque that to balance his posture, and thrust force apply through the braking and pedaling. And also we can extract the air drag as well, okay? because we can estimate the velocities. So on the right, on the left, I'm showing, uh, uh, on the right, I'm showing the 3D reconstruction of the mountain bikers trajectory in three dimensions. Okay? And left, I visualize the, all the force that apply to the mountain bike. Sorry? Air drag. If you know the, uh, the velocity, then you can get the, uh, you can approximate air drag. Actually, in, in our uh, the paper, we actually compare against the real uh, the, the the bike setup. We hire the experienced biker who wears a lot of sensors on his body and use this to the match between these two systems. That makes the, the no, answer your question. Answer. I, I'm, I'm excited that you did that, but I think that um, my, my question is still that um, you could, I'll, I'll make it a question. Do you think it would be easier to start with the bike and match the image rather than start with the image and match the bike? So the one problem with uh, uh, that bike modeling is you can only apply for the bike. You cannot, you cannot generalize this to different activities. So I'm going to show the different activities as well. Okay. So, and this is another example where uh, this guy going through the, this downhill, the mountain biking. Uh, uh, and we actually verify this, uh, the, recons of phys uh, the physical force prediction is makes sense by comparing against the, the real bikers motion. And the, the model that we actually used was a quite simple so that we can generalize this model to the all different types of activities. So for instance, a skiing activity. Okay. So this uh, case, the skier make a lot of banking turn, which is reflected onto the, his thrust force and the road tool, okay. which we can actually extract from this. Don't use the no, we don't use any shadows. Yeah. I mean, that's a good point. And, uh, uh, shadows or the scattered uh, snow, that could be the good signal to use it, but uh, at the time of submission, we don't have time to do it. So, and, and also we can apply it to the different activity like a jet ski, uh, where uh, we can extract, uh, we can estimate the, the high stress force and the air drag from this sequence. And this is my favorite example where a guy jump from the cliff and fly through his wingsuit. Okay. Uh, it's quite fast motion, but we can, actually, uh, we can extract the, the high air pressure and the lifting force and air drag as well from this. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't, uh, <laughs> I'd rather not uh, comment on that. <laughs> so I've talked about the, 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 the behavior cloning, and maybe we can extend this a little bit to understand the dynamics and, and the control of the multi bikers and so on. And the next thing, the last thing that I would like to talk about is the social interaction. Can we learn? social interaction from first-person demonstration. Okay. So 
here's a, uh, the, a match between, basketball match between the United States and the Nigeria, okay, and the London Olympic. And we, as a computer vision people, we try to use this kind of video to understand what's going on. There, right? We extract the, 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 the skeleton out of this image and, and we, uh, uh, we track the people and so on. We segment the people and so on to understand, computationally understand the, what's going on in this scene. Okay? And, and then we, uh, we uh, project those like extraction onto the, this kind of like kinematic model where we can get the X, Y, and theta of the gaze uh, direction uh, to model the human behaviors, the, the player's behavior. But this is not the way we connect. We actually connect it through pixels. I see you and you see me. Right? So this is where we, uh, we first introduced like, the way to exploit the, the pixel information to understand the player's behavior. So, uh, this is uh, first. I ask people to wear the head mounted camera and play basketball. Okay. So, uh, by watching this video, even though this video is quite, again, very nauseous, but there's a lot of signals we can uh, extract from this video. The, the people are looking at the same thing together and they are moving together and so on. Okay. So, there are some group behavior embedded in this first person. Uh, videos. Right. So the output of the system, so input of the system is taking a collection of first person videos and then we predict the, their, the group future trajectories. We predict the location, their future of this. This is output and this is input. So the way we did is we reconstruct the, the, the camera pose in three-dimensional space. So if we have a multiple cameras in the scene, then we can reconstruct their position and location, orientation, everything into the one canonical system using a structure from motion. Okay, so by watching this video, we can somehow understand how they actually interact with each other. And then once we have this registration, we can, register, uh, we can uh, localize the, the player onto the court, some canonical, canonical representation. So this is the location of the player, and then the, the arrow represents their gaze direction. Okay. So people, I haven't talk, I've, I've been talking about the, the behavior cloning, the predicting individual trajectory, future trajectory. So, but this is a little bit different problem because we have to predict the group trajectory to get it. So then how, how different, how are the different? So the players, each players are connected through the physical connection, through the distance and the orientation. The orientation and distance tells you about the physical relationship between players, okay? And most importantly, they are mentally connected. They are looking at the same thing, like this, as we call this as joint attention. So here's a one example of the predicting joint attention, reconstructing joint attention. So the, the green triangle represents the my gaze direction, okay? individuals of gaze direction, and the red and blue point correspond to the location of joint attention in three-dimensional space, where people are looking at simultaneously. This joint attention formed at the intersection of the gaze direction. As so shown. So, this way we can connect multiple players together mentally. Yeah, I hate to say it, but there's a game, a game theory aspect. Not You don't want to look. We're going to pass the. Yeah, I mean, that's a uh, valid question. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't know how to <laughs> answer that. But yeah, I think, but I think, yeah, that's something that we have to uh, investigate more on this, like where 
is there any other visual signal we can pick up from the first person? Yeah, 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 yeah. that's right. Yeah, yeah, the peripheral vision. Anyway, so we can uh, approximate their their joint their their uh, mental connection through this joint attention. Okay? So we have a joint attention and a physical connection. Also. So using these two connections, these two cues, to predict their trajectory in three-dimensional space. Okay? I'm not going to detail how to actually predict it, but uh, the key idea is the two cue. The primary cue here is the physical connection through the distance and orientation and the mental connection through the joint operation. Okay. So this is a, our input video. Uh, people uh, wear head mounted camera and playing basketball. Okay. And uh, this is uh, our prediction. This is uh, uh, the group's uh, trajectory. And also we predict the location, the joint location, where they're going to attend in the future, in a few seconds. So the time horizon that I'm talking about is like uh, from zero to 10 seconds. Okay. So, and then here uh, I project this is the 3D joint attention and the trajectory onto the, to the first person image. Okay. So I see that the, the trajectory actually, uh, uh, this, uh, the predicted trajectory is a pretty good uh, uh, valid model that can uh, the predict the, the, the group behavior right, as a whole. So uh, before conclude, uh, I, I have talked about a little bit about the eye hand coordination. Okay? But so far, only thing that I've talked about was just eye and head. I haven't talked about anything about the head. So this is like a first person image, which is a very difficult to get the hand location and 3D orientation and so on. Okay. So uh, what I'm thinking is I'm, uh, I have to build another system that can actually reconstruct the hand, uh, hand uh, location and so on. So we build a new system uh, at the uh, University of Minnesota where they can combine the first person vision and third person camera. So this is like a small camera so, uh, surrounding this, uh, this uh, stage where it composed of uh, like a few hundred cameras and we are looking for uh, like most of pixel densified uh, system which is like we can fit the 20 pixel per millimeter cubic the square okay, at high frame rate. So using this kind of system we like to reconstruct the whole body motion in three-dimensional space and relate with my first person. For instance, like this. So uh, this is like a very uh, preliminary data where uh, I do some jumping on the stage and we reconstruct the 3D body location, the blind spot location, like this. So the, the goal is like uh, eventually we want to combine this first person vision with uh, this third person system. And hopefully, in the future, we can uh, play ping pong inside. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this concludes my talk, and thank you for your attention. The best of both players, the golden gopher team, or is it just anything else? <laughs> the, 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 the basketball player? Were the basketball the players members of the golden gopher? No, 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 no. <laughs> And we're, they would, they no, they are there. <laughs> no, no, no. They, they are the semi-professional. Uh, oh, okay, we, so I wanted to know. Okay. okay. So we uh, we uh, ask uh, we talk, yeah we we ask uh, the, the some Chinese university team. These players actually uh, play for their university. Oh, so okay. this they, they are pre uh, experienced players. Okay. You know, when, when you model the uh, table tennis, a large part of the priors are your own action. That's the way you hit the ball predicts where you're going, where the opponent's going to the ball next. Mm -hmm. So there's a huge forward planning action depending on your action. Mm -hmm. 90% of the time, 
position. Yeah. And also, as I said, I mean, this is like a, the, the, the game that, to a diversity game, where uh, the first person vision can also tell you about the how opponent behave. Like, how, what's so like a pulse you take? And based on that, how can we actually predict the ball trajectory to respond to that, 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 that ball? Any other questions? Okay, so I think we're overdue for a coffee break. Uh, but let's see. Uh, should we restart like half left? Twenty minutes. Okay, so like roughly 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11,